And our next speaker is the Climate and Sustainability Lead at Google DeepMind Institute, where she works with teams of researchers and engineers on the application of AI to solve challenges that contribute to climate change. Sims Witherspoon has spent 11 years building technologies for social good and was founding member of Google's crisis response team. Sims is also the co-founder of the Center for AI and Climate, an international organization based in London. Please welcome Sims Witherspoon. everyone, how's it going? Oh, last session of the day, fantastic day. Um, if you will indulge me, I would love to start with an audience poll just to see the challenge that lays ahead of me in the next 15 or so minutes. Um, if you believe that AI can help solve the climate crisis, will you please raise your hand? Yes? Okay, all right, I like that. What about no? I'm not gonna give you a middle option. Anyone for no? Oh, we've got a couple no's. All right, let's see if we can move you all in the next, in the next few, uh, few minutes. Um, so, one of the things, oh, let's actually go backwards. Doo -doo -doo. There we go. You know, I'm asked fairly frequently what AI for climate change actually means. And um, it's a cheeky but fair question because when we're talking about artificial intelligence, there is no single system that we're referring to. There are all kinds of AI doing all kinds of different things. And believe it or not, the same is actually true for climate change when it comes to the fact that there is no single definition. The IPCC defines climate change as a quantifiable change in Earth's climate that is due to either natural processes or human activities. It's a very scientific definition that gives us kind of both op options, anthropogenic and natural processes. The UNF UNFCCC, on the other hand, also a scientific body, they, they actually disagree. They say, that through their scientific uh, definition, that climate change is anthropogenic. It is human-caused, either directly or indirectly. Then you take a look at other organizations that are on the front lines of battling challenges related to the climate crisis, like NGOs. Greenpeace, you'll see much more emphatic language used with groups like this. You know, I believe Greenpeace's definition goes somewhere along the lines of, you know, climate change is the, the most um, impactful environmental risk humanity faces today. And then you look at governments and militaries, and they take a much more risk-focused approach to the definition. In the US, where I'm clearly from, given this accent, uh, they call it the mother of all risks. So if you're in this audience and you have been a little bit confused or you've had trouble wrapping your head around the concept, don't worry, you are definitely not alone. But you know, the thing is, if we're going to solve climate change, and the climate crisis, if we're going to tackle it, then we actually need to understand how we're going about defining it because problem definition is where we start when we begin to come up with a solution. So as you can see from these various definitions, there is no single solution to climate change. Climate change is a scientific challenge, an economic problem, a socio-political issue, and so much more. And so, what we have to do is, as you've heard many speakers today to say, we need to work together, even when we are only leaning into our individual expertise areas. It's gonna take academics, regulatory groups, corporates, NGOs, and affected communities all contributing in their area and working cross-functionally. I'm a scientist, so that's what I can talk to you about today. I approach climate change as a scientific challenge. I'm also a techno-optimist and an artificial intelligence product manager. So I can also approach it as a technological one. The first thing we do as scientists is we try to understand the problems we face. So how we do that in AI, which is what I'll talk to you a little bit about today, is in addition to research, as we are an R&D company, the very first thing we do is we speak to the people experiencing the problem. Now, these are people who are either on the front lines in the affected communities or maybe the domain experts in industry who have been working on these problems for years and know everything about the space. 
We go to them to not only understand the problem at hand, but also, you know, what are the things we need to use to measure success? What are the benchmarks we need to be hitting to actually consider ourselves successful? And for AI, an AI solution, you know, how much better does our solution have to be than your traditional methods to make the cost of switching over even worth it? You know, without talking with these folks, the ones who are experiencing or working on the challenges, every organization, whether it's corporate, academic, NGO, they risk wasting time and resources, which in the climate crisis are both incredibly valuable in this urgent task to solve the problems at hand. And we just, we can't, we can't do that. We don't have the time. So once we understand the problem space, what's the second thing we think about? Well, in AI, we determine whether or not AI is even the right solution and what type of AI is if the answer is yes, we think it is. So this is where I'll pause and I'll say, AI is not a silver bullet. I know I had lots of yes, yeses in the audience when I asked that question at the beginning, but I also really believe it's important to say that AI will not solve all challenges driving the climate crisis. It isn't even the right tool for many of the challenges that we face. AI also needs to be deployed safely and responsibly not to mention until our grid itself is run on carbon-free energy, every energy intensive technology will carry a carbon footprint and that includes artificial intelligence. In other words, is AI the right solution for the role, for the challenge at hand is an important evaluation step. Sometimes a simpler solution is better than a high tech one. But in our world, the objective determines the system we build. And what we believe is that we can approach how AI can be really useful in a three-part framework that I will call the understand, optimize, accelerate framework. So first, AI can be helpful in helping us understand climate change and its effects on Earth's ecosystems. It can also help us optimize current systems and infrastructure because we can't just start over from scratch today. And third, which is where most people's minds probably go when they think of artificial intelligence, is that it can help us with the breakthrough science and technology we need for a more sustainable tomorrow. Now, lastly, what we do is we focus on understanding the how. If we believe that our solution falls into one of those buckets. We think AI is the right solution and it can either help us understand, optimize, or accelerate breakthrough science and technology. Then the next step is we focus on the how. Can we get this out of the lab and into the real world? Because when it comes to climate and sustainability solutions, the impact is really what matters. Again, why we also start with talking to domain experts to make sure that we're building tools that they will effectively use. So. We consider how we're gonna build that effective system and get it into the real world. Answering this question around how is where we see which solutions are actually feasible. We might have a long list, but as soon as we start looking at the deployment pathway, certain options just fall off the table. Whether that's because of today's regulatory environment, our you know, infrastructure, or any of the other constraints and dependencies that we have to consider, such as data, which has been you know, mentioned many times today, or even viable partners. So now that's a pretty complex process that admittedly I have broken down into three reductive steps. But I'll use an example that I hope helps bring it home. Today in the UK, well, every day in the UK really, we talk a lot about the weather. So I'm going to use example that I hope everyone in this room can relate to. Heavy rain. Now, heavy rain is an issue that can damage people and property. There is an entire team of experts at the Met Office, so the, UK, um, the UK's meteorological service, that focuses on heavy rain. Now, if you remember that step one, you know, what's the first thing we do when we consider researching a problem is we go talk to these experts. So we went to the UK Met Office and we learned about the problem from them. You can imagine the first images we were shown is the same ones you see on the Weather Channel. It's those pictures in various colors that show the accumulated rainfall and kind of the patterns of, of the rainfall across the country. And they taught us not only about the problem, but also about the forecasting methods that they use. 
highlighting that as far as the solution goes, what they needed was something that was you know, higher resolution and also more accurate in capturing the physics of heavy rainfall. Told us that that would be incredibly interesting for them if AI could deliver it. Now, that was also only half of the problem. They don't only need at more accurate forecasts. Another thing that they shared that they would need is they needed more useful ones. Because at the end of the day, in addition to doing their jobs, a human forecaster is responsible for how to interpret them and provide predictions to inform others in critical roles, such as aviation, agriculture, water management, and even the little things like, do you need an umbrella today? or a brawly here in the UK, although that always sounds really weird in my accent, so <laughs> umbrella. Um, but it also is going to become more urgent when we think about the fact that the increase in extreme weather that is being caused by climate change. So you can see how, how important getting these more accurate, more, interpretal, uh, more interpretable forecasts really are. So what we did with the Met Office, because they were fantastic. They also had a radar system. They have data that covers 90% of the country, 99% of the country actually. And what we did was they were able to share that data through a feed that every five minutes delivered information at a one kilometer rev resolution that gave us data in units of millimeters per hour for atmospheric moisture. Now what did that enable us to do? That enabled us to you know, look at the, the uh, rainfall that was happening uh, in the UK, and we focused on the, next two, the immediate next two hours because those, that's the pattern that really mostly affects property um, and the economy. And we fed it into a generative AI system that we call DGMR. And DGMR essentially watched the data feed that the Met Office provided us like it was a movie. And it did what a lot of us do when we watch movies, which is try to predict what happens next. And you know, what we were especially interested, I mentioned, was the next two hours of rainfall. And what's really exciting is that we showed statistically significant improvements in these regimes compared to the competing methods. And not only that, but we did a, quali a qualitative assessment with 50 meteorological experts at the UK Met Office, and over 90% of them preferred our methods, ranked them as their first choice to the traditional methods that they were using before. Now, to, for us, this also takes us back to those steps. And after talking to the experts, after determining that you know, we believed AI was the right solution because it could clearly help us understand these patterns of rainfall, um, and help mitigate negative impacts. We also, from this feedback, were convinced that we would be able to deliver insights that were useful to the experts that were deploying these systems in the real world. Now, there is a lot of work that still has to go into our research, but we have made the source code, data, and verification methods freely available to the community. And we are really excited about the applications for AI in this area, as well as many others. I think one of the things I'm also really excited about is that given the time we have today, I only have the chance to talk to you about one specific sector. But the truth is, is that that understand, optimize, accelerate framework, you can dive into electricity systems, agriculture, transportation, and you can apply it to think about all of the various ways that AI can be useful. Now, you also, to work in AI and climate, you know, you don't actually have to be techie. You know, I, I say this sometimes that you know, you don't have to be techie to work in tech. For us, if you are a data holder, you, where it's safe and responsible to do so, you can release the data sets, share those with researchers, and allow us to work on the problems that are affecting your industry. If you're a domain expert working in industry, share what your challenges are so that we can ensure that AI pursuits go out of just being purely academic and really make an impact in the real world. If you're a deployment partner, I mentioned earlier, and, and the panel earlier stressed at the very end how key partnerships are. So if you're a par deployment partner, please reach out to us. My team's email is right here. And let us know what innovative systems you might be willing to, to test. And I think for everyone interested in this space, know that you know, your purpose really follows passion. 
you can get involved in AI for Climate in whatever way you are most passionate about. It takes a diversity of skill sets and a variety of backgrounds to do this work from, yes, research scientists and computer scientists, but also policymakers, industry experts, comms and marketing, marketing specialists, and so much more. So while AI for Climate may be a very nebulously defined area, we can build concrete solutions to help us tackle the crisis. Thank you. <laughs>